had to do. Then I was called for another two years. Uh, yes, <laughs> to get my um, you know diploma to be able to um, you know take the board. Uh, so that was quite an adventure, but um, you know we, we don't regret that we didn't go back to California and stay here. My husband is a general dentist, and I used to work with him before I um, you know started doing what I do right now and decided to move on my own. Um, we have uh, two kids. Uh, my son is a sophomore at Carmel High School, and uh, my daughter is in fourth grade in Town Meadow. Uh, we live really, really close to the office, which is very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, um, why? Um, yeah, the, the, this is this is where I am right now. Early prevention orthodontics. This is what I do, and. Um, why, why I decided to um, you know, concentrate on early prevention, why is it very important? Um, now, the, the usual age when, when orthodontists would see uh, the child is around 11, 12, 13. Now, the problem with that is that by, by that age, the most of the facial growth is complete. And things that we can do um, when children are much younger, we cannot do at this age still. Pretty much all we have to, we uh, can do at this age, uh, just to put braces on to make the teeth straight. But um, if if a child has problems, if they're already developing, um, they they can be uh, evident really early. Um, that's why I like to see kids at three, four, five years of age. Um, like for example, today I um, just, I saw um, a boy who is seven. But um, his little brother, who was two, was, was with him. And I can tell you that this two-year-old had my, uh, more problems than this seven-year-old. And maybe there is not a lot of things that I can do with this two-year-old, but I can see that the problems are already developing, and there's still some things that, that we can do at this age, too. So why, you know, why would I wait for you know, the age when I can put braces on the teeth, when, when I see the problems developing? So that's why um, that's why I decided to uh, really, you know, concentrate on, on early treatment. And how I how I got to this, um, I, I of course I received traditional orthodontic education when I was doing my residency, and um, you know I was taught how to put braces on the teeth and make teeth straight. But really, it never made sense to me because. You know, you make teeth straight, then you put, you know, patients need to wear retainers for the rest of their life. Otherwise, uh, teeth will get crooked again. So, and, uh, you know, I was taking a lot of um, C courses, continued education courses, and um, during one of the seminars, uh, the, the speaker was from um, Holland, and he mentioned um, the company, uh, my functional research company, MRC, and the appliances that they're using. And I decided to, um, you know, get some more information about it. Just Google them, and uh, this is when I first learned about my functional influences on um, development of the teeth and jaws. Um, you know, the role of the muscles, so lips, cheeks, and tongue, on the growth and development of the teeth, jaws, and face. And this is really was a turning point for me. You know, suddenly everything fell in place and um, I feel like, yeah, now I you know, kind of understand what's going on and what's really happening. Um, and, um, but, but then of course, you know, you, uh, you know, you learn more, you feel like you don't know anything, you need to, you feel like you need to learn more and that's when I, uh, you know, realize that, okay, I need to know, I need to learn about breathing, I need to learn about, um, you know, everything, breastfeeding, tongue tie, um, <coughs> sleep disordered breathing, uh, you know, everything, because everything is so um, tightly connected together, you know, we cannot just, you know, separate the teeth from the rest of the body, uh, put braces on them, make, make them straight, and, you know, don't think that it's going to, it's not going to affect the, the rest of the body in, in any way. Um, so um, that's why I decided to, you know, start with 
you know, really little kids and to do early treatment because this is where it all starts. Um, and, you know, the, there's really a lot of things that I can, you know, talk to you about, but today I will, um, you know, just do this presentation about the tongue and the role of the tongue um, in the facial development um, of the children. Now, tongue is considered to be the, the strongest muscle of the body, gram for gram. And um, this, this picture shows, uh, you know, like uh, it takes only one point, about 1.7 gram to move the front tooth. Uh, the lower lip can exert pressure from 100 to 300 grams, and uh, the tongue is capable of exerting force up to 500 grams. So uh, you can imagine if the tongue is not positioned properly or is not functioning properly, it can do a lot of damage to surrounding structures, whether it's a jaw, teeth. Um, and usually when we talk about function of the tongue, uh, the main functions are what taste, mastication, swallowing, and, and speech. Um, but uh, really from, um, you know, perspective of what I am doing and um, uh, from the perspective of proper um, facial growth and development, uh, the function of the tongue is um, that the tongue is really driving force behind the correct development of the upper jaw and, and the entire face. And really there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, the role of muscles and tongue in particular um, has been known for centuries, I would say that. Um, and this is just a you know, brief uh, review of history. There are just a few names that I want to mention. Um, Sir Charles Tones, he was a British uh, dentist, and in 1873 he formulated the concept of balance between the forces of pleural musculature and the tongue. Uh, James C. Wallace, father of preventive dentistry, uh, in his essay of irregularities of the teeth in 1904, he mentioned that natural suckling and chewing exercise the muscles of jaws and tongue. The tongue stimulates the maxillar or upper jaw, the alveolus, and the teeth during growth. A lack of spacing in the primary teeth is due to lack of outward pressure on the arches by a fully developed tongue. Edward Engel, who is considered the father of modern orthodontics, Recognize the influence of the facial muscles and dental occlusion. Recognize that the tongue resting position could possibly be an orthodontic obstacle. And he believed that mouth breathing was the main etiological factor of a compromised resting posture and subsequent mouth occlusion. Um, Alfred Rogers, uh, he uh, introduced the concept of my functional therapy. And uh, he he was convinced that incorrect general body posture and particularly an imbalance between facial muscles resulted in malocclusion. And he developed a series of specific uh, exercises for um, each facial muscle. Now, in his paper, uh, Living Orthodontic Appliances, he actually referred to muscles as living orthodontic appliances. And he, um, uh, he said that muscle function alone can correct malocclusion. Now, Raymond Silkman, he's a, uh, it's our days, he's a holistic dentist in California. And uh, this is a very interesting article. I don't know if anybody read this. Is it mental or is it dental? And it uh, talks about cranial and dental impacts on total health. I really highly recommend uh, for you to read this article. It's very, uh, you know, written very easily. It's really, really easy to read. And there's a lot of interesting things you'll find there uh, that, you know, you may never thought about. And what he is saying is that the most important orthodontic appliance that you all have and carry with you 24 hours a day is your tongue. John Mew, he's a British orthodontist, and he's a father of orthotropics. Orthotropics is a facial growth guidance. And... Um, now his quote is, lack of tongue pressure hinders the growth of the maxilla or top jaw. Put conversely, the maxilla may not be able to achieve its inherited potential without assistance from tongue posture. And this is his uh, tropic premise 
the basically the foundation, the, the fundamental principle of um, orthotropics, which says that the ideal development of the jaws and teeth is dependent on correct oral posture with the tongue resting on the palate, the lips sealed, and the teeth in light contact for between four and eight hours a day. So <clears throat> this proper oral posture, uh, every child who grows up with proper oral posture, with tongue up in the roof of the mouth, lips closed, teeth touching or slightly apart, uh, breathing through the nose, and um, this is a very important thing, there shouldn't be any movement of lips during swallowing. So if a child grows up with all these things, then um, the child would grow with straight teeth, with nicely developed face, and is going to be a, a healthy child which is really rare in our <laughs> industrialized society, uh, very rare to see in our children. You know, I go to my daughter's school and I look at the kids and I don't know, 85, 90% of them are with their mouth open. And I don't need to look in the mouth to know that they have crooked teeth. And they, that they have some medical issues, that they're not really healthy kids. Um, so tongue posture is the key. Uh, if we look at this picture here, you can see that the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth. And uh, when it's up in the roof of the mouth, then the tongue exerts this outward force on the upper jaw and on the teeth. Now, this is the inward force from the vaccinator muscles or cheek muscles. So when the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth, there is a balance of these forces. And this is what maintains the integrity of developing upper jaw, developing maxilla. Um, now the tongue is broad, it's U-shaped. So if it's up in the roof of the mouth, then the upper jaw will grow really nice and wide and U-shaped because it's gonna be the shape of the tongue. Uh, and we're gonna discuss this picture a little later. Um, yeah, and this is just uh, what I just said. And uh, another thing, every time when we swallow, um, and I'm talking about subconscious swallow, which happens on average 2,000 times a day when we swallow without eating or drinking. Um, at this moment, the tongue is also creating a considerable amount of force and it's pushing on the upper jaw and you can just try yourself you know put your tongue up in the roof of the mouth close your teeth and swallow you can feel considerable force that the tongue exerts on the upper jaw and this force also um, makes the the upper jaw go forward in the face um, yeah and then when we have this um, the balance of forces then the teeth teeth are going to grow between between the tongue and the cheeks. That's the, um, you know, the, the way of res resistance. And they will grow, they will grow straight because the, the upper jaw will be nice and wide and there will be room for all the teeth. And this is the shape of the normal upper arch. It's U-shaped and it's the shape of the tongue and it has room for all the teeth. Now, when the, when the upper jaw grows wide enough and forward enough, then the entire face will grow correctly. And, you know, we're talking about normal facial growth, and this is horizontal growth. So the normal, the favorable facial growth is a horizontal growth. It's mostly forward and a little down. And then the face will be in good balance, uh, upper and lower jaw will be positioned forward in the face and the airway, which is behind the jaws, will be nice and wide and open. And then the, the air will flow freely through the airway because they are nice and open. And these are just, uh, you know, examples of good facial development, all this 
um, beautiful people. You can see, uh, you know, the nice jawline here and, uh, you know, really nicely developed cheekbones and, um, you know, face nice and wide and uh, nice and wide smile and you can see all the teeth and all the straight and, uh, you know, all the bright eyes. These are all the, um, um, you know, signs of good fish in the boat. And, and now look at this kids. Um, so they all have in common open mouth posture. <coughs> Even this little one. And how old is the baby? You know, a month or less than that. Mouth is already open. So, um, and this is how most of our kids these days look like. Um, again, a little bit of uh, history. Uh, Dr. Harville, he was Norwegian orthodontist, and uh, <clears throat> during 1960s, he recognized that oral restoration associated with obstruction of the nasal airway is a common finding among patients seeking orthodontic treatment. So he conducted a series of experiments with young monkeys where he blocked their noses with silicone nose plugs. And the results were that all experimental animals gradually acquired a facial appearance and dental occlusion different from those of the control animals. So you block the nose, posture changes because they open their mouth, and then you get all the different kinds of things. You get in crooked teeth, um, see that the mouth is open here, uh, they had lowered uh, lower jaw, they had open bites, they had tongue protrusion. Um, oops. Um, so posture changes teeth. As soon as they open their mouth, then the growth of the face goes wrong. So back to this picture. So the tongue is down below. As soon as the mouth is open, the tongue drops down. And you know, you can feel it for yourself. Keep your lips together, bring your teeth together. Where's the tongue? It's touching the tongue. Okay, okay, so most of you will have tongue up in the roof of the mouth when lips and teeth are closed. Now, keep your lips together, but separate your teeth to three millimeters. Where's the tongue? The floor. So some may have in the forward mouth, some may have in between the Not teeth. Between. between the teeth, right. Now open up your lips, open up the mouth completely. Where's the tongue? Down below. Down below. Okay. So as soon as we open the mouth, that's what happens. Oops. Tongue, tongue drops down. Now there is nothing up in the roof of the mouth supporting the upper jaw. But vaccinator muscles are still pushing, and that what's causing the you know pretty much collapse of the of the upper jaw and um, underdevelopment of the upper jaw. The jaw grows narrow, um, and you can see here I have this thing that I usually show to my patients. So when the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth, that's a good shape of the upper jaw. Now, as soon as it drops down, well, that's, that's what's happening. So cheeks are pushing, the tongue is not in the roof of the mouth, it's not supporting the jaw. That's what's happening to the jaw. Hmm. Um, now again, if you breathe through your mouth, the tongue drops down. And the upper jaw becomes narrow, and the teeth become crooked. Okay. Now this picture shows uh, different tongue positions and corresponding bone occlusions. And you can see here when the, when the tongue is against the palate, then the teeth will be straight. Uh, if we go here, for example, tongue is in between either back teeth or in between the front teeth. So when the tongue is in between the back teeth, then uh, we're gonna get deep bite. When the tongue is in between the front teeth, we're going to get open bite. If the tongue is completely down below, then most of the times lower teeth will be straight. 
bite the upper jaw of your nose. So what are the causes of mouth breathing? And um, you know, I'm not really going to talk about each one of them, but um, you know, the main is nasal congestion. Um, and it really starts early in life due to allergies, colds, um, enlarged tonsils and adenoids, nasal polyps deviate the nasal septum, uh, they increase nasal resistance and you know it makes harder to breathe through the nose and the child opens the mouth and starts breathing through the mouth. Birth trauma, cranial strains, poor posture, bottle feeding, I'm going to talk about it a little later, uh, soap diet, processed foods, um, stress habits, all these things cause mouth breathing. Um, and mouth breathing really affects facial development in two ways. So if um, you know the, the upper jaw, if it's not going, if it's not growing wide enough, then the face will be uh, long and narrow. And at the same time, if it's not growing wide enough, it also doesn't go forward enough. It's going to be kind of set back in the cranium. Um, and this is just um, you know for the fun of it. A picture comparing the Gothic arch and the Roman arch and um, the pr properly developed upper arch um, looks like the Roman arch it has this u-shape shape of the tongue now when it doesn't grow correctly then it takes um, this v-shape and looks like the Gothic arch so we want Roman arch and really the you know, only when the upper jaw uh, has ideal side and uh, you know ideally positioned in the in the face, then the the entire face will be developing properly. And you can see here in this picture that this is this is upper jaw, the maxilla, uh, in green, and it really takes this whole mid occupies the the whole mid face. Um, now the upper jaw is connected to 11 cranial bones. So you can imagine that if the upper jaw is not growing uh, properly, if it's not growing wide enough or forward enough, then all the bones that are attached to the upper jaw will not be growing properly as well. Um, like for example, um, two thirds of the floor of the orbit is upper jaw. Um, you know that roof of the mouth is at the same time the floor of the nose so if the for example a child has a um, you know high vaulted palate then the volume of the nasal cavity is um, uh, decreased and then it also makes breathing through the nose much more difficult um, and really you know why why do we need to care about whether you know the cranium or the whole face grows properly? I mean, what's really so important about it? What are the important things that we have in the cranium? Like what? Brain, eyes, ears, nose, nothing really important. So is it really important for this part of the body to grow correctly? Um, so when the upper jaw is not growing properly, then we're talking about unfavorable facial growth. And uh, unfavorable, uh, unfavorable facial growth, it's, uh, it's a vertical growth. It's a growth down and back. So instead of this face, face is gonna look like this. Or like this. Um, now this is where the face should be, but with the down and growth face, it's, it's here, down and back. Um, so yeah, unfair, unfavorable facial growth, um, you're looking at long faces, flat cheeks, receded chins, um, narrow jaws with uh, lack of space for all the teeth and again, people growing quickly. 
I'm guessing just a little bit comparing good facial development and um, poor facial development. And these are, again, some examples of unfavorable facial growth. Um, you can see this big kind of smile here and really narrow upper jaw, but not the top part. They all have long faces. So what are the consequences of mouth breathing in children? Um, we talked about abnormal polio facial and bone development. Now, in large tonsils and adenoids, um, you know, it's interesting uh, because they could be the reason of mouth breathing, but at the same time, they could be a consequence of mouth breathing. Because if a child is breathing through the mouth, then tonsils may get enlarged just because the you know, they working like um, you know garbage cans. That's the only actually um, defense, um, you know, for the air that be going through through the mouth, because it needs to be you know clean somewhere. So that's the function that tonsils take. Um, ear infections, stuffy noses, and this is also interesting because. Um, you know, stuffy nose, it can be the cause of mouth breathing, but at the same time, it can be a consequence of mouth breathing because it's just the, um, the attempt of the body to reduce the amount of air that the body is getting by getting the nose stuffy. Um, now, things like bronchospasm, and asthma attacks, that could be the uh, consequence of mouth breathing as well snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, seven to 13% of all preschool children snore, and two to 3% of all preschool children have obstructive sleep apnea. Um, what uh, happens when, uh, and, and that's, yeah, we're talking about children. So when, um, Children have poor sleep habits when they have snoring, when they have sleep, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, they get poor oxygenation of the blood. And that can uh, not only bring, uh, bring up major medical issues such as failure to thrive, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, but also neurocognitive impairment and behavioral problems. Um, and um, studies have suggested that as many as 25% of children diagnosed with ADHD may actually have obstructive sleep apnea and that much of their learning difficulties and behavioral problems can be the consequence of chronic fragmented sleep and sleep deprivation as a result. Um, so really ADHD has been um, really you know, misdiagnosed a lot of times. A lot of times, you know, we're just dealing with the sleepy kid who is trying to stay awake, and the, you know, the behavior is the, completely the same as with ADHD child. So it's very, you know, very important to for parents to know if the child has behavioral problems. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the child has ADHD. Maybe it's just sleepy, sleepy kid who's trying to stay awake. Um, and. The, you know, this is just a picture showing uh, regions of um, pharynx, and you can you can imagine that if both jaws are positioned back, if they're not developing forward enough, then this whole space will be decreased, and then um, the structural narrowing of the airways um, will bring the problems such as snoring and sleep apnea. Uh, now, lower jaw. Um, of course, uh, if upper jaw is underdeveloped, it's going to hold the, the, the lower jaw, and uh, this is going to cause uh, lack of space for the tongue and pharyngeal tissues, and uh, it will reduce the size of the airways. Now, lower jaw is always grow to match the upper jaw, um, provided that the teeth are um, near or in or near the contact at rest. Uh, which is uh, possible only with the mouth closed. So when the teeth are closed and the 
blow a jump mill is what you blow because if the mouth is open, then there's no feedback for, for the blow a jump, it just doesn't know where, where it should go. And these, these are just two x-rays that compare. Um, uh, <coughs> this one shows uh, the vertical growth of the face and the, the width of the airways. And um, after the treatment, when the vertical growth was changed into the horizontal growth, to favorable growth, you can see the, um, how much wider the airways became. And that's another picture of uh, good and not so good facial development. These two boys are from, from the same tribe, but you can see uh, that this one has really nice and um, you know, really nicely developed face broad face, straight teeth, and um, this little guy who already has this long face, and you can see that the teeth are already crooked. Um, and this is, um, well, j just a few words about it, because tongue tie is uh, the second reason why the tongue cannot be up and over the mouth, and um, um, That's that's really you know some uh, with this, but um, really the length and flexibility of the lingual cranium affects resting posture of the tongue. So if the cranium is really short and tight, then there's no way the tongue will be able to get up on the roof of the mouth and you know be there. So the the jaws can develop properly. So this is um, you know something really important that we need to be able to diagnose and uh, you know, um, talk to um, parents about. And really, mouth breathing uh, really starts during first weeks of life, and that's where the, the breastfeeding uh, plays, uh, plays a crucial role. Because uh, what happens during breastfeeding, and you know, probably know this better than I do, um, but the nipple actually adapts to the to the shape of the mouth, and the, the motion, this peristaltic motion of the tongue, um, um, you know, presses the breast against the, the palate, and this you know kind of milking the breast. That that what develops the, the jaw, this forward thrusting of the tongue to extract milk from the breast. That that's the that's the force that develops the upper jaw and uh, um, you know. The, you know, brings us forward, forward development of, of the upper jaw. Now, bottle feeding, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the nipple on the bottle usually is a standard shape and size, and it doesn't adapt to, to the baby's mouth. Now, bottle feeding, uh, and, you know, according to studies, uh, it comes with hyperactivity of vaccinated muscles or cheek muscles. Um, now, vacuum um, that uh, is created during bottle feeding can cause the collapse of the upper jaw. Um, bottle feeding can also separate the epiglottis and soft palate connection, which is uh, a very important in infants and which gives them this opportunity to uh, you know, eat and breathe at the same time. Um, and um, according to one research, uh, bottle-fed babies had more than double the risk of posterior close bite, again, because of this hyperactivity of vaccinated muscles, um, you know, which pushing, pushing on, the, on the jaw and makes it narrow. And bottle feeding can also drive the, the tongue back and alter the action of the tongue. And another thing about bottle feeding is um, as milk is expressed from the bottle, then uh, there is a vacuum created inside the bottle. And in order to uh, get this vacuum released, um, the, I mean, the baby has to release the seal around the, the nipple, and the air goes in. And that's the moment when the mouth breathing starts, because the baby needs to open the mouth to you know, let the air go into the bottle, and they breathe through the mouth. So these are the things that um, uh, really encourage low tongue posture, and uh, you know we really don't recommend them. Pacifiers, sippy cups, and bottles. 
and that's that's what we recommend um, you know drinking from a cup and I don't know if you know there's 30 cups have you ever heard about them no. well it's just something that I uh, I found and I thought you know they're really cool because they 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 say that they can be used starting from three months of age I mean they cannot of course hold the cup but um, they can at, at three at three months of age they are already able to uh, start drinking from the cup instead of, <coughs> instead of giving them a bottle how big are they oh I can I, I have them okay. yeah I can show it to you and the good thing is they have this um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just show them to you okay and the last thing uh, muscle uh, muscle development really muscles that we use to chew our food with are the same muscles that hold our jaw closed and our, mus our, our mouth closed so if these muscles are not developing properly and usually it's due to the foods that we're feeding our kids you know it's mushy soft um, cooked foods that don't require all this muscle activity to, to chew uh, that's why the muscles are not developing properly and that's uh, you know that's why um, they just can't keep the mouth closed and again mouth is open and the tongue drops down and that's when all problems start thank you <laughs> <laughs>